Hello and welcome to EDH Rex Upping the Average, where we take a commander's average deck list as compiled by the data on EDH Rec and make some quick swaps to it to help take it from being a good start to a great start. This week, by popular request, it is all about the ninjas. Yuriko the Tiger Shadow is a breakout star from Commander 2018. She costs three mana, technically, and is a 1-3 human ninja with Commander Ninjutsu. This allows us to pay two mana and return an unblocked attacker we control to our hand to put her onto the battlefield either from our hand or from the command zone, tapped and attacking. Best of all, whenever a ninja we control deals combat damage to a player, we reveal the top card of our library and put it into our hand, and then each opponent loses life equal to that card's mana cost. Her page contains a really nice mix not only of ninjas but also of unblockable cards that help get them into play. A lot of people really dug the Orzov cosplay from the Tesa Karlov videos, so I think I'm going to try out some ninja cosplay this time. Are you ready? Nailed it. All right, let's load up Yuriko's average deck list and put it into the Architect deck building website. Remember, any swaps that we make have to either be cost neutral or help lower the price of the overall deck list. This is a genuinely tight list. If this is your starting point, Eureka will take you far. It'll be hard to make too many improvements to this one, but let's give it a shot. There are three categories we can tackle here. As usual, there's budget, and I'd also like to address the deck's top deck manipulation as well as some of its tricks. Let's start off with budget. This is a commander deck full of one mana one ones, and it's pretty incredible. It doesn't need to be blinged out much farther past that point to be made really good. Yuriko is aggressive and amazing and doesn't need like a bunch of money behind her for the deck to do what it wants to do. If you're beginning your build with Yuriko, don't worry too much about the big fancy flashy spells or the expensive artifacts. The main place to flesh out and focus on should definitely be the ninjas. Some ninjas, by dint of just not having been reprinted in a while, have reached the 3 or sometimes even the $7 price point. When upgrading this deck, prioritize those cards, because they're really what the whole deck needs. But what we don't need is to go out of our way to spend this much money on a scroll rack, or even a sensei's divining top. Heck, we could buy a whole other deck for the combined price of some of these cards. In fact, a lot of the instants in the average deck list are pretty hard on the wallet. Cyclonic Rift is like $40, and the new free spells from Commander 20 are also pretty crazy. I'm going to swap these with cards that A, are cheaper, and B, nicely complement Yuriko's ninja trigger. First, Coastal Breach is a sorcery speed bounce that won't ever actually cost 7 mana. It's fun to hit with Eureka Trigger, and it's pretty easy to cast. Deadly Rollick I'll replace with another undaunted spell, Curtain's Call. It reads a 6 mana, but it usually casts for like 3. I have some ideas for Fierce Guardianship's replacement too, but we'll get to them in a bit. I also have to stop real quick and acknowledge that even some ninjas are over $20. Sakashima Student is a seriously great card, but as with all the budget cuts in these videos, I don't want to assume that every player can or will or should drop this much on a single card. Let's therefore try out Spark Double instead. It can become a copy of Yuriko that avoids the legend rule, dishing out double Yuriko triggers and melting enemy life totals. There are two more cards I'm cutting for price, and which also will lead us into our second section. Those cards are Mystical Tutor and Limb Duel's Vault. These are cool because they set up the top of the deck for us to dome opponents with some great big mana cost. I'm cutting them for budget reasons, but that means we have to stop and have a quick chat about the nature of Yuriko's game plan, and how it relates to, or rather how it may conflict with, the idea of top deck manipulation. Some of the highest priced cards in this deck are the cards that allow us to manipulate the top cards of our library. The idea is really cool. You manipulate the top of the deck, make sure that there's a big spell on there, hit someone with Yuriko, and then make everyone else lose like 9 or 10 life by revealing that really huge spell. Thing is, I don't think we need that all that much, especially not if it's going to be a substantial hit to the wallet. We could certainly spend some time or cards putting a big spell on top of the deck, but we could also just get some ninjas in play and hit people with them and then reveal the top three cards and make them lose a bunch of life that way. Any time cards and attention that we give to setting up the top of our library is potentially time cards or attention that we've taken away from setting up our board full of ninjas. If we hit our opponents with enough ninjas, we'll get so many Eureka triggers that we'll deal a pretty satisfactory amount of damage anyway. Careful, precise top deck setup is kind of ousted by the sheer density of combat triggers that are available to us. If I can wax philosophical for a second, a tornado can't stack two pennies, but in this case, it doesn't need to. Basically, it's accuracy by volume rather than accuracy by precision. So we're cutting the tutor and the vault for budget considerations, but we're also tossing scheming symmetry. I don't like this card, and I don't think you should either. Yes, we can put a high-cost spell on top of the deck, but A, that telegraphs to our opponents what our plan will be that turn, letting them know to remove our commander for sure or to fog the combat. 
And B, if I'm your opponent and you give me the option to search my library for a card, I'm definitely getting a card that will directly defeat you and your ninjas 100% of the time. There's not even a lot of political interplay to be had here either, because any opponent who we try to make a temporary truce with will still be getting hurt a bunch by whatever big card is flipped off the top with Yuriko, making them less likely to accept a deal. Cutting down on the density of top deck manipulation also means we have to be more critical of the miracle spells. These can be cool, but without the pricey top deck manipulation cards, they're tough to miracle reliably, and 7 mana for an extra turn spell is a pretty tough sell. I'm generally against the practice of running big mana cards like Draco in Eureka decks, cards that are only there to be flipped off the top but which get stranded in hand if we don't have the mana to cast them. And just look how trim this mana base is. There are only 34 lands and like 4 mana rocks. This deck is blisteringly fast. So the 7 mana here is kinda meh. And Devastation Tide, I'd like to swap directly for Evacuation to have some more instant speed interaction. One final card I'm slicing in this section is Thassa's Oracle. This is used by some of the more competitive Eureka lists in conjunction with the likes of Demonic Consultation and Doomsday, but without direct synergies like those, I don't feel the need to run the Oracle here. It can technically set up the top of the deck, kinda, but I'd rather play an evasive creature here, one that lets us enable Eureka in the first place. Which leads nicely into how I plan to replace all these cards I've been cutting. Like, yeah, alright, great Joey, you've removed the expensive cards and noted the ripple effects that that has on the deck's top deck manipulations. But what now? Easy. Do more ninja stuff. We've got a Xenograft and an Arcane Adaptation in the main board. Note that Yuriko's actual ninjas are not great. Many of them fail to be unblockable on their own, usually relying on ninjutsu abilities to flip into play from an unblockable creature. That means that we tend to have a lot of unblockable creatures back in our hands that we would like to redeploy and have them be meaningful even after our ninjas are already in play. Turning those evasive creatures into ninjas makes Yuriko's board of maybe three or four one-drop creatures into a genuine total nightmare that could drop life totals by 10 or even 15 every turn. Thus, here are two more enchantments to join the adaptations. Conspiracy and Unnatural Selection. And don't forget what I mentioned earlier about how we don't need to carefully stack the top of our library if we're just going to be hitting with a bunch more ninjas. I want to get more tiny creatures in here that our opponents will have difficulty blocking, specifically one-drop creatures. These can all help get Yuriko out as soon as turn two, and they have different forms of evasion to help stay meaningfully unblockable to at least one opponent at the table, because one opponent is all that it takes. Mausoleum Wanderer in particular seems a little silly, but sometimes that one-man attacks can be the difference between whether an opponent gets to wrath or not. The main highlight here though is definitely Siren Storm Tamer. That fierce guardianship earlier is $30, but this one's just like a buck, buck fifty, and it both enables and protects our commander with exceptional grace. I'll also highlight Wingcrafter here because it can grant evasion to another ninja later on, something that a lot of the ninjas need pretty desperately. And speaking of evasion, Moth Dust Changeling is technically a ninja that can also become evasive, which is pretty cool. I have two more cards to add here to help increase our density of hard to block creatures. Let's make room in the mana base for some creature lands. I won't assume that everyone has some of these more expensive lands, but I will assume that everyone wants to play lands that can turn into flying creatures. Be mindful of your tempo and of your colorless sources in your mana base, because this is a very quick deck and you'll often need specific colors, but turning a land into a ninja or ninjutsuing from a land is pretty rad if we need it in a pinch. Alright, time for section 3. We've made the budget more friendly, added a lot more evasive creatures and ninja enhancing enchantments, but now let's turn the corner. Let's talk about some of the deck's tricks. There's actually a really disgustingly cool trick that Yuriko can pull even after combat damage has been dealt. It's counterintuitive, but as long as we're here upping the average on our deck, we might as well up the average on our gameplay knowledge too. There are five steps of combat. Beginning of combat, declare attackers, declare blockers, damage step, and end of combat. End of combat is when some effects trigger, like the wearing off of the Myriad ability from Blade of Selves, or the delayed trigger from Flame Rush Rider. Once a creature is declared an attacker in the declared attacker step, it is considered an attacking creature throughout all the rest of the steps in combat. This means if we attack with a creature, and it isn't blocked, and then it deals damage, we can still ninjutsu it away into a new creature before moving into our second main phase. It's weird, but we can totally do it! This is the same rule that allows players to untap creatures with the enchantment Reconnaissance, even after creatures have already dealt damage. Ninjas basically always have a moment after damage to swap out if they ever need to. That's right, the deadliest thing about ninjas isn't their silence or their skill or their speed, but simply their intricate knowledge of the rules. 
This detour is basically my way of saying to watch out for tricks where this can be useful, because ninjas in hand are sometimes more valuable than ninjas in play. Sometimes we genuinely want an important ninja back in our hand, whether that's because it will protect that ninja or because that is a way for it to get through an opponent's army later. Familiar's Ruse actually shows up in the original average decklist for exactly this reason. Getting the ninja back to hand is useful so that we can attack with a random unblockable creature, and then switch it out for a ninja that otherwise wouldn't have been able to get through our opponent's army. When making this video, I was actually originally considering cutting the card Cunning Evasion from the average decklist, until I remembered how it works with Yuriko. If a ninja becomes blocked during combat, we can return that ninja to hand, and then ninjutsu it back into play by bouncing another unblocked creature, to allow the original ninja to finish its original attack. That's really cool! I just feel like that's a really important lesson for Yuriko players. Where other tribes, like goblins and elves, want to have just a bunch of that creature type in play, because the number of them is what allows them to overwhelm their opponents, ninjas have a lot more restraint. Holding a ninja back in hand is what allows them to have a huge degree of flexibility during combat. And not only that, it directly feeds into their ability to create situations on their following turn where creatures will go unblocked. So let's find some other small tricks that can also help improve our ninja army. There's a split card in this list that I'm just not a huge fan of. Split cards have the combined cost of both halves of the card, which makes them great hits if flipped by Yuriko's ability. With that said though, this one is pretty lackluster. We're really never going to cast the aftermath half of this card, and if we only ever plan on using the blue half, why not replace it with a card that is, far and away, much better? Far and Away's mana cost is pretty comparable, and it has a similar enough effect on the blue side, but with the added bonus of having a second half with an effect that we might actually really want to use to get rid of multiple blockers or creatures that are attacking our way. This card's flexibility has impressed me even in demir decks that aren't trying to take advantage of its total converted mana cost. I'm feeling inspired by the card Commit to Memory in the average list too, so I'm going to add one more here. The other split card I want to add is Spite and Malice. It deals 8 damage if flipped off the top, but more importantly, Eureka wants more counter magic, and the second half isn't all that unrealistic to use either. I'm mostly taking the cue here from the 4 mana cost on the commit, but consider tightening up the mana costs on your own counter spell suite if you don't feel you hold up 4 mana often enough to make these cards trustworthy. Keeping Eureka protected with counter magic is really the ultimate priority, not just having high cost cards to flip off the top of the deck. I just like living the dream and protecting Eureka while also trying to make everyone lose 8 life with this one. I've got a bone to pick with two artifacts in this average list too. Biden to Thassa is just unnecessary. Eureka players have proven to me that they draw more cards than they can handle. If Biden was a necessary effect in the deck, we'd be seeing its other compatriots too, but they don't show up here. The message is clear, Eureka decks will draw enough cards without this effect. And the other artifact I don't like all that much is Whisper Silk Cloak. It's just slow, we don't need it. By the time we've equipped this, we could have just attacked with an unblockable creature and ninjutsu Eureka into play already. I've got one final cut here, and brace yourself, because I am cutting a ninja. Throat Seeker doesn't do what we want here. Lifelink on our one or two power ninjas? Even in the ideal attack, this will probably only gain us like five life. This is a three mana creature with no evasion. It has a useful creature type, but I'm going to replace it with a different ninja, Azra Smoke Shaper, which surprisingly doesn't show up in the original average deck list. Or maybe it's not that much of a surprise, because it's not exactly a home run ninja, but it has a cheap ninjutsu cost, and that's what really matters, because it lets us manipulate our attackers by flitting multiple ninjas in and out of play during a single combat when the need arises. And you know we're not about to leave without a couple final pieces of secret tech. First up, I want to add Submerge to this list, because it is a 5 mana card that costs 0 mana to cast. All we need is for an opponent to have a forest and for us to control an island. Over half of the top 20 most popular commanders in the format contain green in their color identity. So for each one of our opponents, there's like a 50% chance that their decks may contain green. So this is dang near a certainty. Eureka's all about tempo and surprises, and this card perfectly encapsulates both of those philosophies. Our last addition is clearly the reason why this section is called Tricks, it's Trickery Charm. One mana to give one of our ninjas evasion for the turn, or to make one of our unblockable creatures into a ninja, or to set up the top of our deck. See, I'm not removing all of the top deck manipulation, this is a really fun spell. All three modes are very relevant for Yuriko, which makes this a ton of fun to add. And there we have it, our final Yuriko list. The link to the deck list can be found in the description below, with the cuts in the maybe board. So let me know what you think of these cuts and swaps in the comments below, as well as any other recommendations that you have for your fellow Eureka players that will help take their game to the next level too. And of course, commanders that you would like to see in future Upping the Average videos. Thanks so much for watching.